Good afternoon, Saxons. This is Ms. Masters, your North High Librarian, with First Chapter Friday. It is December, and we only have a couple of weeks until winter break. So this month's Fridays, I'm going to be reading to you from holiday books. Today's first chapter comes from Dash and Lily's Book of Dares by Rachel Cohn and David Levithan. And the book takes place in New York City during the holiday season. So here we go. Chapter one, from Dash's point of view. December 21st. Imagine this. You're in your favorite bookstore scanning the shelves. You get to the section where a favorite author's books reside, and there, nestled in comfortably between the incredibly familiar spines, sits a red notebook. What do you do? The choice, I think, is obvious. You take down the red notebook and open it, and then you do whatever it tells you to do. It was Christmas time in New York City, the most detestable time of the year. The moo-like crowds, the endless visits from hapless relatives, the air stopped cheer, the joyless attempts at joyfulness. My natural aversion to human contact could only intensify in this context. Wherever I went, I was on the wrong end of the stampede. I was not willing to grant salvation through any army. I would never care about the whiteness of Christmas. I was a Decemberist, a Bolshevik, a career criminal, a philatelist trapped by unknowable anguish. Whatever everyone else was not, I was willing to be. I walked as invisibly as I could through the Pavlovian spendrunk hordes, the broken winter breakers, the foreigners who had flown halfway across the world to see the lighting of a tree without realizing how completely pagan such a ritual was. The only bright side of this dim season was that school was shuttered, presumably so everyone could shop ad nauseum and discover that family, like arsenic, works best in small doses, unless you prefer to die. This year I had managed to become a voluntary orphan for Christmas, telling my mother that I was spending it with my father and my father that I was spending it with my mother so that each of them booked non-refundable vacations with their post-divorce paramours. My parents hadn't spoken to each other in eight years, which gave me a lot of leeway in the determination of factual accuracy, and therefore a lot of time to myself. I was popping back and forth between their apartments while they were away, but mostly I was spending time in the Strand, that bastion of titillating erudition. Not so much a bookstore as the collision of a hundred different bookstores, with literary wreckage strewn over 18 miles of shelves. All the clerks there saunter slouch around distractedly in their skinny jeans and their thrift store button downs, like older siblings who will never, ever be bothered to talk to you, or care about you, or even acknowledge your existence if their friends are around, which they always are. Some bookstores want you to believe they're a community <coughs> center, like they need to host a cookie-making class in order to sell you some Proust. But the Strand leaves you completely on your own, caught between the warring forces of organization and idiosyncrasy, with idiosyncrasy winning every time. In other words, it was my kind of graveyard. I was usually in the mood to look for nothing in particular when I went to the Strand. Some days, I would decide that the afternoon was sponsored by a particular letter, and would visit each and every section to check out the authors whose last names began with that letter. Other days, I would decide to tackle a single section, or would investigate the recently unloaded tomes, thrown in bins that never really conform to alphabetization. Or maybe I'd only look at books with green covers, because it had been too long since I'd read a book with a green cover. I could have been hanging out with my friends, but most of them were hanging out with their families or their wees. We? Wees? Wee? -e? What is the plural? I prefer to hang out with the dead, dying, or desperate books. Used, we call them, in a way that we'd never call a person. Unless we meant it cruelly. Look at Clarissa. She's such a used girl. I was horribly bookish, to the point of coming right out and saying it, which I knew was not socially acceptable. I particularly loved the adjective bookish, which I found other people used about as often as ramrod, or chum, or teetotaler. On this particular day, I decided to check out a few of my favorite authors to see if any irregular editions had emerged from a newly deceased person's library sale. I was perusing a particular favorite, he shall remain nameless because I might turn against him someday, 
when I saw a peak of red. It was a red mole skin, made neither of mole nor skin, but nonetheless the preferred journal of my associates who have felt the need to journal in non-electronic form. You can tell a lot about a person from the pages he or she chooses to journal on. I was strictly a college-ruled man myself, having no talent for illustration, and a microscopic scrawl that made wide-ruled seem roomy. The blank pages were usually the most popular. I only had one friend, Thibaut, who went for the grid. Or at least, he did until the guidance counselor confiscated his journal to prove that he had been plotting to kill our history teacher. This is a true story. There wasn't any writing on the spine of this particular journal. I had to take it off the shelf to see the front, where there was a piece of masking tape with the words, Do you dare? written in black sharpie. When I opened the cover, I found a note on the first page. I've left some clues for you. If you want them, turn the page. If you don't, put the book back on the shelf, please. The handwriting was a girl's. I mean, you can tell. That enchanted cursive. Either way, I would have endeavored to turn the page. So, here we are. Number one, let's start with French pianism. I don't really know what it is, but I'm guessing nobody's going to take it off the shelf. Charles Timbrell's Your Man, 88, 7, 2, 88, 4, 8. Do not turn in the page until you fill in the two blanks. Just don't write in the notebook, please. I can't say I'd ever heard of French pianism, although if a man on a street, wearing a bowler, no doubt, had asked me if I believed the French were a pianistic sort, I would have easily given an affirmative reply. Because the bookstore byways of the Strand were more familiar to me than my own family homes, I knew exactly where to start, the music section. It even seemed a cheat that she had given me the name of the author. Did she think me a simpleton? A slacker? A numbskull? I wanted a little credit, even before I'd earned it. The book was found easily enough, easily enough, that is, for someone who had 14 minutes to spare, and was exactly as I pictured it would be, the kind of book that can sit on the shelves for years. The publisher hadn't even bothered to put an illustration on the cover, just the words French pianism and historical perspective, Charles Timbrell. Then, new line, forward by Gabby Cassidasis. I figure the numbers in the moleskin were dates. 1988 must have been a quicksilver year for French pianism. But I couldn't find any references to 1988, or 1888, or 1788, or any other 88 for that matter. I was stymied, until I realized that my clue giver had resorted to the age-old bookish mantra, page, line, word. I went to page 88 and checked out line 7, word 2, then line 4, word 8. R you. Was I what? I had to find out. I filled in the blanks, mentally respecting the virgin spaces as, she, as she'd asked, and turned the page of the journal. Okay, no cheating. What bugged you about the cover of this book, besides the lack of art? Think about it, then turn the page. Well, that was easy. I hated that they'd used the construction an historical when it clearly should have been a historical, since the H in historical is a hard H. I turned to the page. If you said it was the misbegotten phrase an historical, please continue. If not, please put this journal back on its shelf. Once more, I turned. Number two, Fat Hoochie Prom Queen, 64, 4, 9. 119, 3, 8. Two blanks. No author this time. Not helpful. I took French pianism with me. We'd grown close, I couldn't leave her. And went to the information desk, where the guy sitting there looked like someone who had slipped a few lithium into his Coke Zero. I'm looking for Fat Hoochie Prom Queen, I declared. He did not respond. It's a book, I said. Not a person. Nope. Nothing. Uh, at the very least, can you tell me the author? He looked at his computer as if it had some way to speak to me without any typing on his part. Are you wearing headphones that I can't see? I asked. 
He scratched at the inside of his elbow. Do you know me? I persisted. Did I grind you to a pulp in kindergarten, and are you now getting sadistic pleasure from this petty revenge? Stephen Little, is that you? Is it? I was much younger then, and foolish to have nearly drowned you in that water fountain. In my defense, your prior destruction of my book report was a completely unwarranted act of aggression. Finally, a response. The information desk clerk shook his shaggy head. No, I said. I am not allowed to disclose the location of Fat Hoochie Prom Queen, he explained. Not to you, not to anyone. And while I am not Stephen Little, you should be ashamed of what you did to him. Ashamed. Okay, this was going to be harder than I thought. I tried to load Amazon onto my phone for a quick check, but there was no service anywhere in the store. I figured Fat Hoochie Prom Queen was unlikely to be nonfiction, would that it were, so I went to the literature section and began to scan the shelves. This proving fruitless, I remembered the teen literature section upstairs and went there straight away. I skipped over any spine that didn't possess an inkling of pink. All my instincts told me Fat Hoochie Prom Queen would, at the very least, be dappled by pink. And lo and behold, I got to the M section, and there it was. I turned to pages 64 and 119 and found going to. I turned the page of the moleskin. Very resourceful. Now that you've found this in the teen section, I must ask you, are you a teenage boy? If yes, please turn the page. If no, please return this to where you found it. I was 16 and equipped with the appropriate gender identity, so I cleared that hurdle nicely. Next page. Number three, The Joy of Gay Sex, third edition. 66, 12, 5, 181, 18, 7. Two blanks. Well, there wasn't any doubt which section that would be in. So it was down to the sex and sexuality shelves, where the glances were alternately furtive and defiant. Personally, the notion of buying a used sex manual of any sexuality was a bit sketchy to me. Perhaps that was why there were four copies of The Joy of Gay Sex on the shelves. I turned to page 66, scanned down to line 12, word 5, and found cock. I recounted, rechecked. Are you going to cock? Perhaps I thought cock was being used as a verb, e.g. please cock that pistol for me before you leave the vestibule. I moved to page 181, not without some trepidation. Making love without noise is like playing a muted piano. Fine for practice, but you cheat yourself out of hearing the glorious results. I'd never thought a single sentence could turn me off so decisively from both making love and playing the piano, but there I was. No illustration accompanied the text mercifully, and I had my seventh word. Playing. Which left me with... Are you going to cock playing? That didn't seem right. Fundamentally, as a matter of grammar, it didn't seem right. I looked back at the page in the journal and resisted the urge to turn forward. Scrutinizing the girlish scrawl, I realized I had mistaken a 5 for a 6. It was page 65, not the junior version of the devil's number, that I was after. B. Much more sensical. Are you going to be playing... Dash? I turned to find Priya, this girl from my school, somewhere between a friend and an acquaintance, a frequentance, as it were. She had been friends with my ex-girlfriend Sophia, who was now in Spain, not because of me. Priya had no personality traits that I could discern, although, in all fairness, I had never looked very hard. Hi, Priya, I said. She looked at the books I was holding, a red moleskin, French pianism, fat hoochie prom queen, and, open to a rather graphic drawing of two men doing something I had heretofore not known to be possible, The Joy of Gay Sex, 3rd edition. Apprising the situation, I figured some explanation was in order. It's for a paper I'm doing, I said, my voice rife with fake intellectual assurance, on French pianism and its effects. You'd be amazed at how far-reaching French pianism is. Priya, bless her, looked like she regretted ever saying my name. Are you around for break? She asked. If I admitted I was, 
she might have been forthcoming with an invitation to an eggnog party, or a group excursion to the holiday film Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, featuring a black comedian playing all of the roles, except for that of a female Rudolph who was, one assumed, the love interest. Because I withered under the glare of an actual invitation, I was a firm believer in preventative prevarication. In other words, lying early, in order to free myself later on. I leave tomorrow for Sweden, I replied. Sweden? I did not, and do not, look in any way Swedish, so a family holiday was out of the question. By way of explanation, I simply said, I love Sweden in December. The days are short, the nights are long, and the design completely lacks ornament. Priya nodded. Sounds fun. We stood there. I knew that according to the rules of the conversation, it was now my turn. But I also knew that refusal to conform to these rules might result in Priya's departure, which I very much wanted. After 30 seconds, she could stand it no longer. Well, I gotta go, she said. Happy Hanukkah, I said because I always liked to say the wrong holiday, just to see how the other person would react. Priya took it in stride. Have fun in Sweden, she said, and was gone. I rearranged my book so the red journal was on top again. I turned to the next page. The fact that you are willing to stand there in the strand with the joy of gay sex bodes well for our future. However, if you already own this book or would find it useful in your life, I am afraid our time together must end here. This girl can only go boy-girl, so if you're into boy-boy, I completely support that, but don't see where I'd fit into the picture. Now, one last book. Number four, What the Living Do by Marie Howe. 23, 1, 8, 24, 5, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 seven blanks, and a question mark. I headed immediately to the poetry section, completely intrigued. Who was this strange reader of Marie Howe who'd summoned me? It seemed too convenient that we should both know about the same poet. Really, most people in my circle didn't know any poets at all. I tried to remember talking about Marie Howe with someone, anyone, but came up blank. Only Sophia, probably, and this wasn't Sophia's handwriting. Plus, she was in Spain. I checked the H's. Nothing. I went through the whole poetry section. Nothing. I was about to scream in frustration when I saw it, at the very top of the bookshelf, at least 12 feet from the floor. A slight corner peeking out, but I knew from its slimness and dark plum color that it was the book I was looking for. I pulled over a ladder and made the perilous climb. It was a dusty ascent, the out-of-reach heights clouded with disinterest, making the air harder to breathe. Finally, I had the volume in my hand. I couldn't wait. I quickly turned to pages 23 and 24 and found the seven words I needed. For the pure thrill of unreluctant desire. I nearly fell off the ladder. Are you going to be playing for the pure thrill of unreluctant desire? I was, to put it mildly, aroused by the phrasing. Carefully, I stepped back down. When I hit the floor again, I retrieved the red moleskin and turned the page. So here we are. Now it's up to you what we do or don't do. If you are interested in continuing this conversation, please choose a book, any book, and leave a slip of paper with your email address inside it. Give it to Mark at the information desk. If you ask Mark any questions about me, he will not pass on your book, so no questions. Once you have given your book to Mark, please return this book to the shelf where you found it. If you do all these things, you very well might hear from me. Thank you. Lily. Suddenly, for the first time I could recall, I was looking forward to winter break, and I was relieved that I was, in fact, not being shipped out to Sweden the next morning. I didn't want to think too hard about which book to leave. If I started to second guess, it would only lead to third guessing and fourth guessing, and I would never leave the strand. So I chose a book rather impulsively, and instead of leaving my email address inside, I decided to leave something else. I figured it would take a little time for Mark, my new friend at the information desk, to give the book to Lily, so I would have a slight head start. 
I handed it to him without a word. He nodded and put it in a drawer. I knew the next step was for me to return the red notebook to give someone else a chance of finding it. Instead, I kept it. And furthermore, I moved to the register to buy the copies of French Pianism and Fat Hoochie Prom Queen currently in my hands. Two, I decided, could play this game. If you are interested in reading more about Dash and Lily and their book of dares, uh, you can check out the electronic and audiobook versions on the Sora app or on soraapp.com. Have a great weekend, Saxons.